Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Romans, with this sermon entitled, Conformed or Transformed. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. So this morning we are going to start in Romans chapter 12 and we're going to start in a, in a, a, a section of Romans um, that um, is very, uh, as Scott always likes to say, convicting. There's a lot of convictions getting ready to come our way based on the, the truths that Paul has told us. So we know from Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11, um, some of the deepest and most complex theological truths that, that Paul or we could have about sin, salvation, uh, what Christ has done to us and what it means to be in Christ. Because of all that, and if we truly believe all of that, Paul's getting ready to tell us what's the fruit of that reality. What does that look like for us based on that? Uh, he does the same thing in Ephesians, and, and I love Ephesians. Ephesians is one of my favorite books. Uh, there's a lot of truth in Ephesians. But he does the same thing in Ephesians. In Ephesians, the first three chapters, we're in the first part of his letter to the, to the church at Ephesus. He lets them know, here are the truths of your Christian life. This is what it looks like. And then he lets us know how that plays out. And look what he says, starting in chapter 4 of Ephesians. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So you can see there, as in Ephesians, as he talk, he's sent to the church of Ephesus and now to the church here in Rome, our calling based on our belief and what that looks like. Um, one of Scott's and mine and Timothy's um, uh, things about you know, Paul moving from principle to practice is how does that get me through Tuesday? Based on the scriptures, you know, Based on everything you've told us and everything that's going on, how does that get me through Tuesday? What does that look like when I'm walking through a season in my life that is a trial or something's going on? And Paul is going to tell us that. He's going to give us that right here. He moves from what we call the indicative to the imperative, which the indicative is stating facts. He has given us facts. The truth of our Christian walk and who Jesus is, what that looks like, and now he's going into the imperative, and the imperative assumes a response of obedience. And for Paul, obedience is not grounds for salvation, but it is grounded in the mercy of God. Obedience is not what the gospel requires, it's what the gospel produces. Here's where we live sometimes. We do not have an if-then relationship with God. If I do this good thing, then God's going to accept me. And that's where we live a lot of times. If I do enough good, if I do this, if I go to church every Sunday, if I give, God will accept me. But we're in a God accept. If God accepts us the way we are, God, here's the S word, Fry. God is sovereign. God knows us. God knows us better than ourselves. And based on everything Paul's told us so far, and he's told the church, we can be obedient, and our obedience comes because he has given us so much and done so much for us. We are in a because, therefore relationship, and that's the reason why therefore is in the Bible. The reason why Paul uses therefore so much, and we're going to see it here in a minute, is because of what he's done. He's been merciful to us in Jesus. And because of that, we can respond to his mercy with obedience Here's a word for you. That's an act of worship. Our obedience is an act of worship to God. Let's see if I need the water. 
You can read self-help books. You can have sermons on the nine steps to love your spouse. You can have three keys to managing anger, five ways to parent your child, and if you know how those five ways are, good for you. But at the end of the day, if what Christ has done for us, at the end of the day, if what he has done and how he has loved us is not the center of our thinking, those things don't matter. They're good things, but they don't matter. If Christ is not the center of everything we do, and that's why it's so important, and this is, don't have to, this is my tablet. I, I don't mind technology. I don't trust myself with my computer up here, so this is my computer. So just in case we didn't use stone tablets when I went to school, we had scrolls. Just want you to know. That's right. So the great thing about is we start and really and we start chapter twelve and chapter twelve and thirteen and four and man we're going we're going to get into some stuff that really will click will hit close to home if we really believe everything Paul's told us so far. But this is not a list of moral things to do or moral things. This is if we don't grasp the love of God and the sacrifice of His Son. How do we know what it means to love and sacrifice ourselves? So the purpose of Romans, the purpose of everything we've listened so far is to build within us that deep-seated affection because of what he's done for us. Because of we are in Christ, we have a new filter, and we should have a new filter, a new lens, a new newness of life, and how we, act, we interact with others, but only if we present our bodies. Here we go. A living sacrifice. I appeal to you, therefore, King James says, beseech you. Other translations say, I urge you. This is something from the heart of Paul. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what is the mercy of God? What's the difference between mercy and grace? Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. He gives us salvation. He gives us forgiveness. Mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve, which is punishment. And a lot of those times, those go together. Those are the same side of a coin. We talk about God's grace and mercy, or mercy and grace, and they're interactive. They work together. And because of that, because of God's grace and mercy, He's begging us, He's appealing to us, He's encouraging us to present our bodies. Here's the language of the Old Testament sacrificial season system and the Jews in that time would have understood that. We know in the old system the animals were laid on the altar and God is, is our sin offering. We know that's a foreshadow of him being our sin offering. But if also part of those sacrifices was thanks sacrifices where offerings were given. Uh, one of them was the offering of grain. And it's your first fruit. It's your first thing. It's that first good stuff. I have lock like here it talks about having a uh, it's like having an anniversary gift to your spouse, uh, and hopefully you give an anniversary gift to your spouse because you love them, not because you think you have to. Men. So what do we do? We're, we're, what do we do? We're supposed to present our bodies, and when it says our bodies, this is not our physical bodies. This is our mind, our hearts, our thinking, our whole self. That's why he says this is happening by the renewal of our minds. It starts with thinking. You have to renewal by your mind. Romans 8, 13 says this, so if, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I put in, this, I, I put in here, and uh, the, the thing later, earlier on, <laughs> so where's Eric? I'm going to apologize to you again, Eric. We had a really good discussion in class this morning uh, uh, on our subject, and so, um, what does that look like to present our bodies as a living sacrifice? What does it look like not to live according to this world and these standards of this world? And, and because we just come through Thanksgiving, and uh, it's not as nearly as bad as I think it used to be because we have so much online shopping now, but 
uh, you know, one way you can you can test your spiritual condition is uh, show up on Walmart on Good Friday. You know, Black Friday. They call it Black Friday for a reason. And then I thought, well, if I really if I was going to tell you, if you really want to, if you're super spiritual, um, drive Atlanta Georgia traffic, and you'll see how and see if, you know how spiritual you are. I, I, I tell Linda. Uh, for for folks who know me, I am usually a, a, a really pretty good person, pretty nice person most of the time, uh, until I get on the road. I mean, once I get on the road, it might be a different matter because there's some people out there. Hmm. Hmm. There are. So the more we learn and meditate on God's word, the more we ag- the more we agree with what God says or what God calls morally good. And psychologically satisfactory. So the act of spiritual worship there, the act of spiritual work, the spiritual word there is logos. Uh, it's Greek. Uh, again, King James translated reasonable. This is where we get our word logical. Because of what God has done through Christ, it is logical, reasonable to present ourselves to Him. Not out of duty, not mechanically, not ritualistically, not based on a ritual, and i got to do this. But because of him, it's a reasonable, spiritual thing. From the heart, a deep affection for who God is and what he has done. It can take different forms. It can be singing, it can be lifting of hands, it can be shouting praise to God, it can be praise reports, it can be tears, it can be kneeling, whatever that looks like to you. There's a balance there for us. There is a balance of emotions and reason. There's a balance of emotion. There's nothing wrong with having emotions. There's nothing wrong with us getting emotional. There's nothing wrong with being emotional or having feelings because God has done something for us or He's brought us through something. We can't live in our emotions and feelings. Obedience to God is an active act of our conscience. It's an act of, uh, act of our will. It's a reasonable service. If we follow our feelings too much, if we're not careful of our feelings and our emotions, I don't know about you, but I know how I am sometimes. You have one of those days. If you have one of those days sometimes, and at the end of the day you're going, there is no way I'm saved. <laughs> not, the kind, not the way I've acted today. Not, we will let our feelings dictate things to us that is not true, that it's not scripture, it's not what God tells us. So that's the reason why it's reasonable. It's our spiritual obedience and worship to be that living sacrifice. We just came through the Thanksgiving season, and I hope you folks had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, the older I get, uh, the more frosty mornings I have, uh, the more I appreciate having family around uh, the more I appreciate being with our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids we have great grandkids and and seeing them and, and just having that time and, and as I've grown older Christmas gets more that way for me too um, not so much about presents I, I like presents uh, but there's just something about is you get that point where it's just it's family and you love having family around and we should be thankful um we just should just for to god just for who he is if nothing else because of who he is what he is how much he loves us so how do we go about a renew on our minds well first we push back against what doesn't align with what pleases god here's where the battle comes in Second, we meditate on what God says is good. The word here, world, in Greek is literally this age. So we live in an age that's under the curse of sin. We know we live in a broken world. We live in an age that's influenced by the enemy, an age that believes and teaches lies and deception, that looks for pleasure and money and honor. He's saying here, Paul was saying, don't conform to that. Live like we will live in the age to come because there is an age coming if we truly believe that Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says he is. And whenever he comes back, whenever that may be, again, I'm going to give Millie Kinlaw. Millie Kinlaw was bound. She has 
told, she has spoke this as long as I've known Millie. As long as I've known Millie Kinlaw, she has told me and told Linda, told anybody that listened, that she's going out in the rapture. And she's not going to see death. The God, that Christ is, Jesus is coming before she dies. She believes that. And it may happen and it may not. But he is coming back. There is an age coming. So we live not in the already. We live in the already but not yet. We, we should live like he's getting ready to come back today. By meditating on God's word, we learn to discern or test all. We learn to discern and test all things through Scripture. Is this is this God's will? How often, if you got ready to do something and make a decision, and that was your first question, is this God's will for me to do this, or do we go ahead and do it and then say, "Well, God will bless me on the back end if I do this because this is what I want to do." We become more aware of what is good and acceptable or complete. There's two places where the word transform is used in the New Testament. One's really transfiguration. That's Matthew 17 where Jesus is revealed in his glory. He's transfigured in his disciples see him. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. We don't, I don't have it on the screen. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Our values, our desires, our reactions change, our priorities change, how we approach obstacles change, how we handle things change. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the verses that, that I've heard at, at funerals, and I've actually used at funerals when I've done them, uh, about us, we do grieve, but we don't grieve with like those without hope. We grieve when we lose, lose loved ones, but if we lose loved ones who know Christ and we're in Christ, then we know that it's just a short goodbye. We know that there's time of coming where we'll see him again. And that gets us through. The verb present here is in the present tense, which means we have to do this daily. It's repeatable. It's not something that you're going to do one time and got it. So how often is this on our minds? How often do we consciously think about this? Um, uh, I heard a snippet from uh, from Alistair Begg. I listen to Alistair Begg for one thing because he's Scottish and I love his accent. Another thing because he's theologically sound. And he says that Christians a lot of times live, we are, we are practical atheists. Or we practice practical atheism. And what that means is our theology is good. Our theology is right. We understand who Christ is. We understand all that. And we are sound with that. But we don't live like that. We live like God does not exist. And that's not the way we do it. One of the commentaries that Timothy was giving us or gave us is from N.T. Wright. He talks about here about uh, someone speaking to a CEO of a company and asking him how the year went, how things were going. And he said, you know, it was good. It was doing well. He was okay uh, in several ways. And he asked him why. And he, and he basically said, basically that he listened to everybody else but himself sometimes. He tried to make everybody else happy. And he tried to lose all this input. And nothing was getting done. And all he was doing was spend this time with no expectations of his own. Paul, in a certain, a certain way, is telling us that, that also. Here's the important point from Paul. His appeal now is that we should refuse to let the present age squeeze us into its mold, dictate to us how we should think, and indeed what we should think, and tell us how we can and cannot behave. We're supposed to be transformed. Our, our minds are renewed. We have, to, we have to set the pace ourselves and work out what sort of people we should be. I, uh, I didn't bring it up here. I left it down there. You know, we, all have our, we all have smartphones now. Some of our phones are smarter than we are. I, for, your, for you young parents now and what your kids are, 
with social media and, and everything that's out there, I, God bless you having to walk through that. But those all in all are tools. That they're, 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 they're neutral. They're, they're, they're like money. That's the reason why it's said that the love of money is the root of all the evil, not money. They're tools. But how much do we let that shape our thinking? How much do we meditate on that more than we do on God's Word? And I'm speaking to me. I'm not speaking to you on this. How often do we let the culture, and I say that because, again, I, you know, I talk about my road rage. My road rage is not as bad as it used to be. Um, <laughs> it's still bad. But that's conforming to, Scott was talking about this morning in class, and, and, and there's a lot of angry people in this world. There are a lot of bitter people in this world, and we seem to meet them all the time. And if we're not careful, we will end up that way. If we're not careful, you know, I've... And again, it's a conscious effort. It's not something that we can drum up ourselves. It's not something that we can try harder. It's just taking the time to listen to the Holy Spirit and his guidance, and he will always guide us in the right direction. I made a conscious effort, um, I've done it for years, to not get upset when whatever line I'm at or in, it goes slow. Because whatever line I get in is going to be the slowest line. It just happens. Or to be patient with the person who's waiting on us when we go out to eat. Part of that's because I used to be in that business in that industry, and part of it's because my son is. But um, if we believe Jesus is who He says He is, and He did what He says He did for us, we're supposed to be different people. And I've said this before, so I'll say this, and and I don't live up to it as much as I should. The older we get, the older and the longer we walk with Christ, the sweeter our spirit should be. And sometimes it's not that way. I don't know why we get to be grumpy when we get old. I'm going to be one of those, if you remember the Muppets, you remember the two old men up there, the two old men up there complaining about everything, that's going to be me. I just got to find somebody hanging. I think me and Fry are going to do that to Timothy one of these days. But we should be transformed. The present age here, in Galatians 1, 4, Paul tells us that the present age is evil. And like many of the first century Jews, he believed that the world history was divided into the present age, that rebellion, the corruption and death, and the age to come. And he believed that age to come already had begun with Jesus and started with his death and his resurrection. So that age to come, not here already, but not yet. Already, but not yet. We, we are seated in high places. We are righteous because of Christ. Th therefore, in that position, we... We need, we need to stop letting the world dictate us its own conditions and terms. We need to let, not let the world tell us how we'll behave, how we'll think, how we'll do that. Now, we need to do that in a loving way and be gracious and be merciful. Because again, remember last week, Timothy's talking about, Paul talking about his letter, we shouldn't, so, we shouldn't think so highly of ourselves. We should not be of that mindset that God should be very fortunate that he has me in his family. But we should realize and understand that we are all sinners saved by grace. We all deserve hell. We all deserve punishment by, God's, by his grace and his mercy. We are where we are. We're called to be countercultural. Not in everything, not all things, but we are supposed to be countercultural. We must be ready to challenge those parts where the present. I love this. Must be ready to challenge those parts where the present age shouts or perhaps whispers seductively. That would be easier and better to do things that way. While the age to come, already begun in Jesus, insists that there's a new creation means that we must live this way instead. It is look. It is hard to swim upstream. We have those days. It just is. But 
but is it worth it? That's where we are. Because our flesh and the world and everything's on the world makes it look so easy just to go with the flow, just to be this way, just to follow our feelings. And that's not what we're called to. The key to it all is transforming our mind. And transform our mind is a a daily thing, an hourly, it could be a minute thing. It's not something you're going to get two hours on Sunday or one hour on Sunday. There's a hope that we have that we'll be able to live it with something like Christ, and we can't do that. We can't be do it on our own. We can't try hard enough, all that. Back in chapter 1, Paul tells us how people are. Listen to what he says here. Now, first, last, this last four verses of chapter 1. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, listen to what he does. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what not, not to be done. Is this our society today? They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Since they do not seem fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. And look at that. Look at those. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things is no law. There we are. Is that how we live? Is that what we're producing? Is that how our lives look Monday through Saturday? Because it's real easy coming here on a Sunday morning with a facade. That everything's good and everything's right and everything's wonderful. For Paul, the mind and the body are, oh man, are closely interconnected. They're, they must work as a coherent team. I mean, having one's mind renewed and offering one man's, uh, God one's body are all part of the same complete event. What does that look like? To live, be a living sacrifice. We, we saw in the temple um, that the sacrifices there were killed. But our self-offering is actually all about becoming alive with a new life that burst out in unexpected ways once the evil deeds of the self are put to death. For renewal of the mind so that we are able, so we are able both to think straight... <laughs> And instead of twisting and thinking of what the world forces to do. We're going to see later on in these in these uh, in, in the Romans uh, what that looks like. One of the things that we've got to get our minds around and the one thing that we need to really have an impact on us is that we're all called to live as different members of a single body. We are different members of a single family. He's already warned us not being not to think too highly of ourselves. Being loved unconditionally by the Creator makes us makes us special enough without anything else. Now he warns them again, and I thought about this that not to regard ourselves as Premier League Christians. While other people in other places or from other backgrounds are in a different kind of, or a different kind of rank, 
I think about our missionaries, especially the ones we have over in Southeast Asia and, and who they're going to be speaking to and, and how often... Filter. We are very blessed to live where we live. We are very blessed to live in America and, and much more, you know, if you want, to, you want to go a little step further, we're even more blessed because we're Southerners. Born in the South, right? But if you truly look at it, and if you look at it from Scripture and you look at it from the Bible, God put us here at this point in history for this season of life to do His will and to be, be obedient to His glory. And so there's times when I think about our granddaughter and our grandchildren, what they're walking through and what they got in my mind. Like, what are they? Oh. How do you walk this, through this world? Parents, your, God put your child or your children at this place in history for a purpose and a point. Your job is to be obedient to him and raising them. No one is, is uh, Shane Pruitt, I'm going to paraphrase him, he said that when God saved us, he factored our stupidity into that. And to pray over them. Because if God gave them to you, he loves them more than you love them, and he has a purpose for them. I think back to Esther. Every time I think about that, about Anna, man, I, he woke me up one night with that because I was worried. With, you know, just everything that's happened in the world, just, and, and he goes, he says, think about Esther. Maybe you were put here for this time and this season. But we are different members of the same body. And, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this because Timothy will in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and, uh, but there's unity made up of quite different members. And, and remember that. We are not all called, and we are not, and again, Scott talks about this a lot, and I agree wholeheartedly on this. We need to work within our gifting. That gifting looks different to everybody. One of us, we're not, we're not better or worse because some of our gifting is more vocal or more public. Obviously, I spent most of my adult life working with the public, so I've talked to you know, talking is talking is easy for me to do. You can say amen right there. Some of your gifting we will never see. Some gifting people will never know this side of heaven. But you have been given, you, you are still a member of the body. We as a local body cannot function without all our members. Whatever that looks like. Church unity. There's a word for you. In the Baptist. Church unity. What does that look like? That unity is based not on general belief that everyone matters. It's also belief based on what we just saw um, from Ephesians. There is one God, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. There is one universal body. I remember when Gordon was here talking about us being united in Christ. Every Christian across the world, every believer that truly is a believer in Christ is united in the church. There is one church. Now we have local bodies like of us and and how many, how many churches do we pass on the way here? Nine. We pass nine churches on the way to here. The Fries pass more than that. There is one church. There are local bodies, local members. We all have different giftings. We all have different ways of doing things. But at the end of the day, we should be one thing as being that united in Christ. And being transformed. Now, it's a battle. It's a daily battle. We, for us married people, we live with another sinner. And we get on each other's nerves. But I don't get on Linda's nerves. But other than that. We talked about this morning in class. All of Paul's letters. 
all of Paul's letters tell us we're supposed to love each other. If, we, if we're going to draw people into any church, whether it be ours or any other ones, if, we can't, if they can't see that we love each other, how are we going to get them to Christ? I like Ephesians because of Ephesians 4.32. We're supposed to forgive each other because God through cross forgave us. Grace and mercy. A living sacrifice. Do, for us not to be conformed to this world, don't be conformed to its standards, its practices, what it does things, but to be transformed, to mediate on God's word, to understand he has a, a better way. And to live as already but not yet. To live knowing there's coming a day when all this... And look, I'll just give you... You can read If you've not read through Romans, uh, here in a couple of weeks, Timothy's going to talk about bless those that persecute you. Be kind to those people. If, as it matters to you, live in peace with all people. We do that through the renewing of our mind. We do that through the Holy Spirit. We do that through God's Word, prayer, fasting. Everybody has bad days. And maybe you're that person that day that that person needs to see that's got a smile on their face. Maybe you're that person that day that that person sees that spoke a word to them or a kind word to them. There, I'm there's enough angry, bitter people out there. We should not be those people. We should understand, first of all, this is not our home. This is, we're sojourners. We are, we are visitors. We are passing through this world to get home. And we've been given the greatest gift that's ever could be given, and that's salvation through Jesus. That because of his death and his burial and his resurrection, that we have a new life. We're a new creation that we can do so much for him. Thank you for listening to me this morning. Uh, again, it's a battle. It's something we have to do daily. Great thing about it, here, here you go. Let me leave you with this and we'll pray. We're going to mess up. And that's the reason why there's grace and there's mercy. That's the reason why he loves us that much. That even when we mess up, there's grace and there's mercy. And we don't have to be so down on ourselves and realize that we got a God that loves us so much. And he did so much for us. And we're going to celebrate that this Advent season. We're going to, we're going to celebrate the coming of Emmanuel and what that means to us in our walk. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning, God, for who you are. Uh, God, I just thank you for the opportunity to stand and, and try to speak your word. God, help us uh, as your children um, to understand the pressure that comes to conform to this age and to conform to how this world reacts to things and acts to things and, and behaves. And help us through your Holy Spirit and your word to be transformed, that we do have more the mind of Christ. That is our goal in our sanctification as we walk this journey. No one will never get there completely. Uh, but as Paul's already talked about, uh, not having the power of sin over us, not letting sin power over us or have dominion over us. And God, we know uh, that you love us so much and that... Uh, as we celebrate this season, uh, you loved us so much that you took on human flesh and, and walked this world with us and this earth to die for us and to be raised again. And now we can have a new life because of that. And God, help us uh, through your Holy Spirit, God, this week as we leave because Sundays are always good, but Tuesday's coming. And there's going to be things that will pop up and things that will happen and help us to react uh, through your spirit. And uh, just be with us as we continue through Romans. Uh, be with us tonight, God, as we do this.
hanging in the grains. What a special time as a church family to be able to decorate this church and to look at the history of the decorations and what that means to us and to have that time together as fellowship and as family and as we walk through the Advent season. So thank you again this day for who you are, for your grace, your mercy, your love, and we ask the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.